Good evening. It's good to be together again via live stream, and we're glad that you could join us this evening. And we're thankful that we again have the means and the wherewithal to be able to come to you and into your homes in this way and share together uh, the Word of God in a time of Bible study, devotional, a time of worship. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, for your beautiful uh, medley of wonderful songs and wonderful truth in, in beautiful music. So thank you so much for that. And again, um, thank you to our crew who continues to make it possible for us to come together via live stream and to have these moments together. Thank you, Andrew and Alethea Stratton. Uh, Pastor Jared Massey, and also Pastor Mike Katora for all that's been done so that we can uh, present the Word of God to our folks and to others who are tuning in via live stream. I have uh, received several text messages and emails from uh, many of you, and I have learned something over the time 
that we have been going through these days of separation. And one of the things that I've learned, and I have pictures to back it up, I have evidence that supports it, that evidently I'm, I'm becoming quite a hit with, uh, with dogs. Uh, many of you have sent me pictures of your dogs glued to either the uh, computer screen or to the television screen when we are doing live streaming. So whatever that says, uh, I think my response to uh, one of the couples that sent me quite a picture was, I've gone to the dogs. So uh, whatever it is, whatever <laughs> is happening out there, I'm glad to know that man's best friend seems to be okay with us doing live stream. I must admit, those have been heartwarming as well as hilarious, so thank you for sending those pictures. Much appreciated. I do want to remind you that we are coming uh, to you live stream every Wednesday evening at 7 p.m. and also Sunday morning at 10.30 a.m. That is a part of our routine now during the week is to present live stream services during those times. And then also I want to mention that we continue to serve our young people, our youth, and uh, parents of our youth as well as our children through a variety of means that... Um, whether it's Facebook, uh, lessons that are posted on our website, whatever it might be, we are continuing to provide outlets for you to be a part of and trust that those are a blessing and a ministry to you. Also, we've put out a, an email uh, regarding what our hopes are and what our thoughts are regarding uh, the time when we might be able to worship together again and just where we are uh, in dealing with our planning in the midst of uncertainty. And so if, if you have not seen that um, email, you can access that on our website and you can take a look at what we're thinking about, how we're going forward, how we're proceeding, and how we're planning. But let me just summarize where we are in our planning. Uh, we are taking very seriously this virus. People have indeed succumbed to this and uh, their lives have come to a conclusion because of the infection of this virus. So we're taking that seriously, and we are looking at it um, both from an aspect of faith and trust and confidence in God, as well as the fact that God expects us to be prudent and to uh, get our information from sources that we ought to be able to trust and from those who, who are also in the medical field. So we are balancing all of that and wanting to uh, be prudent in our planning as well as responsible to all of you as members of our congregation so that we can best guarantee that when we do finally come together and worship and open up our doors, we will have done uh, due diligence and have been very, very prepared and uh, vigilant to make sure that we are prepared to have a setting that uh, would not harm any of our congregants. So that's our heart, that's our purpose. Many of you have shared ideas with us. We appreciate those, but uh, I want you to know we are giving great thought and great consideration on a daily basis to what we can do, what we feel is most effective, also what is the wisest, most prudent thing that we can do. So just pray for us, and we'll listen to your ideas and uh, Take those to heart as well and give those consideration, but I want you to know that we are uh, monitoring on a daily basis what we, uh, what we believe we can do, what we are waiting to do, and how we are proceeding with caution. So uh, again, take advantage of that email. It's, it's on our website, um, a letter that is explaining those details. Then I um, want, want you to be aware of uh, just the needs in our nation as well as ways that you can pray, pray for our leaders. We're in a very difficult day, and we're in a day that I think politically is perhaps one of the most um, sour and um, malicious and maligning days that in my years I can remember. And how sad and how unfortunate that is that we cannot come together as a as a a nation and realize how severe of a matter we are facing and that that rally us and provide us with a focus that unites us. It's sad to see how, um, how terrible, indicting, ruthless uh, statements can be. So in light of all of that, I would just say pray for our leaders. Pray for our leaders and uh, ask that God will give them wisdom 
and that their hearts will also be inclined toward where we actually derive our help, and that we will see some civility and some decency emerge uh, in very, very trying times. So pray for our leaders, uh, both state level, federal level, local level, that God will give wisdom and uh, discernment and direction uh, and give us good guidance in these days that we can trust, that we don't feel is just partisan um, mudslinging. So pray for our leaders. Pray then for one another. And in, I, I want to encourage you to remember to, to pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ. Some folks have an easier time with this time of isolation than others. So remember to pray one for another, contact one another, and I just encourage you to do that. Continue to do that as you have. I want to thank you for giving, and it's just remarkable to see how folks are just faithfully honoring God, tithes and offerings, and are giving so generously. And I want to thank you as your pastor for being faithful with the resources that God is giving you. And we're just grateful that God is indeed supplying our needs through you. So thank you for your giving. Thank you for your kind thoughts, your emails, your text messages, your phone calls. And thank you most of all for your prayers. All right, enough about those kinds of things. Let's look together tonight. And I just invite you, if you're, um, if you're, if you're following along in your own Bibles, turn, if you would, to a very well-known passage of Scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, we'll read the entire chapter, but we're going to focus our attention primarily on verse 7 this evening. So 1 Corinthians chapter 13, 1 through 13. If I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I have become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. And if I give all my possessions to feed the poor, and if I surrender my body to be burned, but do not have love, it profits me nothing. Love is patient, love is kind, and is not jealous. Love does not brag and is not arrogant, does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own, is not provoked does not take into account a wrong suffered, does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. But if there are gifts of prophecy, they will be done away. If there are tongues, they will cease. If there is knowledge, it will be done away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will be done away. When I was a child, I used to speak like a child, think like a child, reason like a child. When I became a man, I did away with childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I will know fully just as I also have been fully known. But now faith, hope, love abide these three, but the greatest of these is love. You know, in these days of uh, perhaps frustration and stress and maybe circumstances that might lead toward moments of impatience and, and uh, again, in increased stress. I want us to consider tonight unlimited love. I just felt that that was very appropriate and sensed that God was encouraging us this evening to especially focus on one verse, verse 7, and, and look at the idea of how perfectly suited a heart full of God's love is, especially in trying moments like what we are encountering these days. You've probably heard this, maybe even said this, I've had enough. I have just had enough. I too have been guilty of saying that at times and thinking that I'd reached a point where it was appropriate and it was acceptable to say, I've just had enough. But I'd like for us to reconsider that statement because really for the believer, for the child of God and for the one who is um, 
in connection with the resource of all resources. That statement just isn't true. There isn't ever a point where we should say, I've had enough. In fact, we ought to say, I have more than enough. Instead of, I've had enough, I've reached the point where it's acceptable to gripe and complain because even God wouldn't expect me to bear up under this, thinking that that's somehow okay. And so I can boldly just say, I've had it, (laughs) I've had enough. I just want us to say that really, we never ever reach that point. We shouldn't ever reach that point because we have always more than enough. And instead of saying, this is too much to endure, we ought to say, I, I can endure this much too. And that's not just a little bit of a psychological twist and contortion so that we fare a little bit better. It's really true. It's a reality that what the inspired writer Paul is saying is, with the love of God in our hearts made available by the working of God through His grace and through the power of the Holy Spirit, we never ever reach a point where what He gives us, that which makes us like Him, is exhausted. We never reach a point where, it's, where the resources of God are tapped out. We never hit a moment when God's sufficiency is all of a sudden insufficient. So tonight, I just want us to enter into that honestly, openly, candidly, and move away from the notion that it's somehow okay, it's somehow acceptable to reach some kind of a point, a saturation point, where we can just say, this is too much. I've had enough. I can't take any more of this. Now, I'm not here tonight to... um, chide you. I'm not here to throw little barbs at you. I'm in this too. Uh, This passage of Scripture applies to me as well. And so I want us just to look at it collectively and benefit from it and perhaps draw some truth from it that will especially help us in these days. As I was looking again at this text, especially verse 7, I was just reminded of the fact that We should never, ever dwell on what we don't have versus what we do have. And that's not just having an optimistic outlook, and it's not just something that's psychological. It's really something that is deeply spiritual. We should understand that we have more than enough and more than adequate resources for any given circumstance that we might face because the love that we are to demonstrate with people and in circumstances does not originate with us. It originates with God Himself. This is really supernatural. Let's never forget that. This is indeed miraculous. It is not somehow humanly contrived. It's not something that we, we are responsible somehow or capable to generate. We cannot produce this, but by the grace of God and in step with His Spirit and knowing who Jesus is and walking with Him, we have these unfathomable resources available for every one of us. It isn't that someone else is a super Christian and we're just a get-by Christian. The reality is these resources are, without respecting one person over another, these resources are available for every one of us. So I trust that this will be encouraging for us, that this kind of love that moves through life's difficulty and life's trials and life's shifting circumstances with poise and with patience, and with with a true uh, divinely enabled dignity is not what we generate, but it truly comes from God Himself. But we can possess this because He puts it in our hearts. This love that God can give us is especially noted in its relationships. Let's face it. 
Most of our problems in life, even though circumstances can be frustrating and they can have a life of their own to a degree, most of our issues regarding this kind of love and how love expresses itself and the arenas where this love plays out really has to do with person to person, people to people. Our issues really are not with um, the yard, um, the shrubs, the plants, the trees, um, the sky. Our issues really are not with those inanimate things or with, with life that is not human. Our issues are with human beings, with people. So love is most needed and is also most obviously expressed and shows itself in the arenas of life in dealing with people. This kind of love that comes from God is so unlike what the world expresses and how the world lives and what the world considers to be dear and important that it stands out. It stands out in a notable way. It's selfless. It is also in its object and in its purpose and in its intention. It is always desiring the personal benefit, the good, the well-being of the object of its love. So when we look at people, we are to have the same love in us that Jesus has, that God has, as He looks at people, as Jesus looks at people which is, rather than them being some kind of an impediment to us, rather than them being an obstacle that is preventing us from getting what we want or doing what we want, an inconvenience, a problem, rather than any of that, we are to look at people as needing God's benefit, as needing God's grace, and as we look at them, we become hopeful, we become desiring that they too will derive great good from the God who loves them. You know, it really ought to change how we look at people. Verse 7 also gives us a picture of the comprehensive nature, the far-reaching reality of this love that comes from God. Uh, The gifts that have been mentioned in this passage, the gifts that God provides, the gifts of the Spirit all have limits. They run their course. Their effectiveness concludes at one time or another, but love is truly, positively boundless in its importance in its necessity, in its expression, in its dealings with how we move through life and also how we face eternity. It's inexhaustible, it's wide, it's far-reaching, and it is the most important of any grace that God can ever give us. In fact, that's what the text says. If we have this gift, if we have that gift, but we don't have love, it just makes noise, or it's irrelevant, or it doesn't accomplish anything, or it means nothing. Gift after gift after gift without love is shown up in its lack and in its um, missing of the mark in this passage in a great and profound way. So in this wonderful hymn of love, this song of love, especially four areas of human life, Four expressions of human life or arenas of relationship are especially highlighted in verse 7. So I just invite you to look at these with me. Before we look at these four areas, I want us to note that in every one of them, the Apostle Paul uses the word all. He is very prone to use the word all, not just here but in other places as well. Here's what this word means. It means in all respects, no exclusions, no exceptions, or the word means meeting all requirements or all that is required of it because the supply is limitless limitless because the supply that is limitless finds its source in God. 
So keep that in mind. When you look at the word all, it means that there's complete adequacy. There is nothing lacking. There is nothing that is left out. All requirements can be met. All requirements are met. And the reason for that is because it is a limitless supply. But it's limitless in its supply because its source is God. So note that when we look at the word all. It's there in all four instances. So let's look at the challenge of this verse. First of all, as we look at the opening of verse 7, love does what? Bears, it bears all things. Just look at it this way. Love puts a cover on unpleasant matters. Love puts a cover on unpleasant matters. This word really has two translations. Neither one of them conflict with the other. But one of the definitions of this word is a roof. So when we look at the idea of bears all things, that's one of the sides of how this word in the original can be translated. But one of the other ways it can be translated is a covering or a roof over it, which conjures up all kinds of ideas. We're glad for a roof for a variety of reasons. First of all, a, a, a roof will give us protection. It'll give us covering. We need a roof over our heads. We're thankful for that when we deal with all kinds of shifting uh, matters of weather, etc. In another sense, it conceals. It covers. It covers not only in the sense of keeping some things out, but it also covers in, the, in a sense that it doesn't broadcast what is there. It conceals. So how would we translate this word? It literally serves like a roof over things, but it also covers a matter so that it isn't exposed. Or, we could translate it, it keeps a matter confidential. One of the most dangerous undermining practices in any organism, and the church is an organism, not an organization, it's a living entity. But one of the most uh, undermining and um, all affecting in a negative way uh, practices or behaviors is, we know, uh, gossiping, undermining, being one that feels as if every little tidbit of information needs to be shared. The Apostle Paul says love doesn't do that. Love, now I want us to understand this, love never ever um, cuts corners, love never betrays truth, because in, in the verses prior to that, um, love rejoices with the truth. So don't forget that. So we're not talking about being shady, we're not talking about being complicit with something that isn't truthful, but we are saying there, there really is a lot to deal with in the church and among people that it would be honorable, it would be in fact godly, it would be the right thing to do just to keep some things concealed, just to keep some things in confidence. Because there are matters that I might know about my dealings with someone that if I divulge those things, I begin to taint or jade in your eyes that person. And it's unnecessary and it doesn't need to happen because after all, what we ought to care the most about is that even if someone is struggling now, they won't be struggling later. That even if someone is having a difficulty now, they will reach a point with the help of God's grace where that will be behind them and not present with them. Do you get my point? So I just want to encourage us that there is an appropriateness to concealing some matters, and to keeping matters confidential. There's something really wrong, there's something just fundamentally wrong with an attitude in the body of Christ that just looks kind of fiendishly, cravingly at gaining some kind of point of leverage or some sense of importance by being able to broadcast some most recent sordid detail. 
We should not be like that. We should be those who put a roof over it. If necessary, conceal it. And not only in the sense of keeping something that is untoward or unseemly from becoming broadcast widely and damaging someone um, irreparably, but it also means loving someone to the point where even if they are a fairly constant source of unpleasantness to us, we will just bear with it. Now, that's easier said than done. But remember, remember, it is not dependent upon us to manufacture this ability. It is incumbent upon us to make sure we ask God for His sufficiency so that we love like we ought to love. Love beyond what is humanly possible to do. Second, love not only bears all things, but it believes all things. And I would put it under this point. Love gives the benefit of the doubt. Now, it's not naive, and it's not blind, and it doesn't act ignorantly, but love gives the benefit of the doubt. Now, there are good reasons for that. First of all, it's just not very healthy for you or for those around you who have to live with you and have to deal with you for you to be cynical. And if there's anything that can be said about Uh, the church in Corinth, they were a suspicious lot. They were suspicious of one another. They were contentious with one another. They tried to uh, pit one another against another and and say that one had a better gift or or a, a better connection to a spiritual father than someone else. They were a suspicious, contentious lot. So rather than there being a constant unifying grace, there was really in uh, the church in Corinth a chronic source of contention and division. Love is the opposite of that. Love avoids that. It gives the benefit of the doubt. Love takes the risk to trust another and show confidence in another rather than to be critical, and rather to be one that writes someone off, love gives the benefit of the doubt, even if there's not a lot of evidence to encourage that. So one strategy for diffusing rivalry and contention is to believe the best about someone and not the worst. There's just a wonderful nobility to that, that love, as it's portrayed here in this great chapter, urges us um, to participate in and to demonstrate. We are called to take the risk to believe the best rather than the worst. You know, sometimes not only do you find out to your surprise you're right, (laughs) which is a wonderful thing. It's a wonderful thing to think the best and find out, wow, even if down deep in my heart I thought not a chance, it's a wonderful thing to think the best and then realize, wow, (laughs) I was right. Not only do you have that, but you also have the issue that it is powerful for the person on the receiving end of your confidence. How often is someone encouraged to come up to the level of of the trust someone is placing in them? It actually raises the bar for them. It actually encourages them to seek God's help and seek His grace so that they can, in essence, fulfill the confidence that others have placed in them. Rather than feeling as if someone is so critically assessing them and evaluating them that there's there's not a chance that they can ever do anything that is of any value or good. It's remarkable. It's remarkable how our confidence placed in someone else can be a bolstering and encouraging influence. And it it influences them often that the trust we placed in them by the help of God was well-founded. Again, not naivete, but an eagerness to believe the best about others than to believe the worst. John Wesley had a statement. He said, I would rather 
rather think too highly of someone and find out I was wrong than to think too low of someone and realize I was not correct. It's far better to think too well of someone and just be disappointed than to think too low of someone and realize, wow, I really, really didn't read them fairly. That's important for us, I think, to note in the church today. Love believes all things. Love takes a risk to give the benefit of the doubt. Third, love continually hopes for the best. You know, one of the, one of the things that I think we all need to remember is someone hoped the best, maybe still is hoping the best for us. First of all, I believe without a, without a doubt, God's hoping the best for us. Can, can anybody imagine what it would be like to be God, knowing what God can do, knowing that God is unlimited in what He is able to do in the life of one that is yielded to Him? Can you imagine being God and knowing what He can do, knowing that there's nothing impossible with Him, knowing that there isn't an impossible case, and yet there is such an infrequency among those that He loves so dearly to take Him at His word? and to pursue Him, and to seek Him, and to submit to Him. I can't imagine what it must be like to be God, knowing what He can do, knowing what He can do. And yet people, so few, out of the vast majority, so few, ever really trust Him with their lives to do what He has said He would do. That, to me, is one of the most tragic realities of the sufficiency of God is that it is so little received. But the fact is, what is impossible with us is possible with God. So, God, I really believe, pursues us and comes after us, at least in one sense, because He's constantly hoping for the best. Love hopes that the others will do right and rejoices when they do. Not looking for evidence to indict, but refusing also to enjoy another's failure. Love continually hopes for the best. And it isn't blind sentimentality, and it isn't just hopeful optimism but it's confidence in the grace of God. It's confidence in what the grace of God can do in someone's heart if the connection simply is made. So for every one of us, love ought to be expressed, even in the hardest of cases, love ought to be expressed in dealing with people that are hard cases. Love ought to be constantly looking for that glimmer of hope that the person that is difficult for us, the person who is at odds with us and is, is at odds with God, will somehow, somehow, will come to their senses, be awakened to their need, accept what God has provided for them, and become a recipient of the grace that can transform their heart and life. That ought to be our, our objective. We ought to hope for the best in people. Hmm. You know, isn't it wonderful to be pleasantly surprised? You know, often we're, often we're shocked, <laughs> maybe not uh, pleasantly, but it's a wonderful thing to be pleasantly surprised. So it's, it's a joy, it's a delight to pray and to trust and to hope for the best and to keep investing in what God can do and what the grace of God can do in a person's life if they ever, ever yield, if they ever come to the point where they stop their foolish pushback against God, if they'll stop that and turn to Him, it is a remarkable thing what God can do. That's the kind of hoping for the best that we should always have within us. We shouldn't ever reach a point. I remember talking with J.K. Warwick. I remember him preaching a message saying, 
while he was pastoring in Indianapolis, Indiana. He was having terrible, terrible difficulty with um, his son. And in a board meeting, when he was asked how he was doing by one of the wonderful elderly saints in the congregation, how he was doing, he said, I just, I've just lost hope for him. And she just stopped him in his tracks and said, Oh, oh, Dr. Warwick, don't ever stop hoping. Don't ever lose hope. That has stayed with me, humanly speaking, because we can't control a thing. Humanly speaking, we can't control anybody else. We can reach a point when, frankly, the way that we are laboring is in our own strength. Therefore, when it's in our own strength, we can reach a point where we feel depleted, we feel frustrated, it isn't coming along as we thought it should, it isn't coming along in the timeline, time frame that we thought it should. And we can reach a point, just like Dr. Warwick, where we say, I've lost hope. But love that comes from God, that is shed abroad in our hearts, continually hopes for the best. Last, love is courageous for the long haul. Love endures all things. Love endures all things. That word is an interesting word in the original. It means a number of things, but let's just look at it for a moment. It means love, not with a mean spirit, not with ill intent, not with a desire to inflict harm or damage to someone who is perceived as an enemy or an opponent, but in a right sense, love stands one's ground. So even if a culture runs amok, even if morals and mores and norms are radically changed, love stands one's ground. It's constant because God is constant. It reflects His faithfulness and His immovable truth. It holds on, it holds out, and it endures. And I would put it this way, love never ever lets its moral knees cave. After all, we're reminded, having done all to stand, what are we supposed to do? Stand. (laughs) That means that there there is an equipping in God's grace and in His love to remain courageous and to remain faithful for the long haul. And it really means this, there isn't any point at which we are given license by God to let our moral knees buckle. There's never a point where, so I don't, want to, I don't want to give you the wrong impression, not that I, it's, not, it's not that I don't care, I do care, but don't ever call me and tell me, uh, I've, I've had enough, I'm giving up, I'm quitting, because you'll hear something from me. You'll hear something like from this passage from me. You don't have that right. We don't have that right to tell God, in essence, this is too much, you've allowed too much, you've allowed the infliction of too much on me. Where are you, God? Frankly, this is always an indictment on God. If we say that we've had enough and it's more than we can take, and I've had enough and I'm not taking it anymore, if we have that kind of an attitude, we're really saying to God, you've allowed too much to be heaped upon me. It's unfair and I'm not going to put up with it anymore. Now, I could say it's quiet in here, but that's because there's hardly anybody here. We are called to be lovingly, faithfully, courageous for the duration. It really is a picture of a quiet stability and poise towards circumstances and people and any kind of a given moment that requires patience. It is a quiet stability but a wonderfully peaceful poise that just stays faithful, stays true. In other words, another word would be love is steadfast, because in verse 8, we really have the punctuation of the allness of verse 7. Love 
never fails. Now, I didn't write that. The inspired Paul wrote that. And if we are, if we are to do as A.W. Tozer said, let the Scriptures be the Scriptures. Let the Scriptures be the Scriptures to us. If we are going to be shaped by them, and if we're going to pay attention to them, and if we're going to make sure that we don't twist them to, to better suit our taste at the moment, if we're going to let those stand as the measuring rod for us, then this is what the Apostle Paul, inspired as he was, said, love never fails. So there's not a point where we can say, it's too much, I've had enough, I'm not putting up with it anymore, it's overwhelming, I'm done, I quit, I've lost all hope. There's never a point where we can do that with any justification. Love never fails. Here's why. Because if, now if we're looking to ourselves and to our own resources and what humanly we can take, we'll cave at any given moment. But if we're remembering, my supply is from God. The love is, in essence, available in a conduit. And everything that I need to fill this truth and fulfill this love call is possible because the God of all possibility, with whom nothing is impossible, is the source on the other end of the conduit giving me what I need in that moment for allness, for sufficiency, for adequacy. We have all that is required at any given moment. I'm struck with that tonight. I am just, especially in our time where there, there's so much being said about having had enough. We have enough. We have enough. Because on the other end of the line is the God who is the origin of this kind and quality of love. This love, this love that is generated by God and that He sends to His children, this love never fails. So I just want to encourage you tonight. I know I've gone a little bit longer than I normally do, but this is such a great passage. Um, We needed to do it justice. I thank God for this word tonight. What a tremendous word it is. We have all to be all. We have all we need. We have a sufficiency that is never depleted, never drained. We have a divine resource for this marvelous love. Father, we thank you tonight for your word, and we thank you for your truth, and we are grateful for it. This truth speaks to us. I pray that this marvelous word will encourage us. I pray that it will shape us. I pray that it will help our gaze and fix our attention and our focus. And help us, Lord, indeed, to focus on you. Author, Jesus, author, finisher of our faith, the one who is our marvelous supply, our sufficiency, our grace. We have needs and we have folks who are in need. We lift our wonderful faith family to you. We pray, Lord, for those who are physically in need, that they will be touched by the great physician. We pray that for those who are encountering grief and loss, Father, be the comfort you've promised you would be. For those who are being stretched in resources, provide all of our needs, we pray. And may the end result be a people that rise up and give you praise, honor, and glory. Be with, be with us. Help us, O oh God. Help us, O oh God, to be, to be more than conquerors through Jesus Christ, our Lord. May we realize the sufficiency available for us all. Keep us strong and help us to keep the faith in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. 
We'll see you Sunday morning, Lord willing, 1030 a.m. I would say you're dismissed. I don't know what that means. You can go to the kitchen now. You're dismissed.